that the, these early spiritual humans, if you like, had been turned by um, John Stott, it was, in fact, who first came up with this term homo divinus, the divine humans, um, the ones, if you like, the first ones who knew God in this personal way. So what that means, therefore, in this model, is that being an, at that time, being an anatomically modern human is necessary but not sufficient to know God, to have personal fellowship with God, but God's revelation to individuals is necessary to make them spiritually alive, which I guess is not that strange an idea um, for us today. Indeed, now remains the case. So then the fall in, um, in this Model C becomes the disobedience of Adam and Eve, the homo divinus, to the express revealed will of God, bringing spiritual death in its wake. Not physical death, but spiritual wake. And so in an extension of this model, just as Adam and Eve were the federal heads uh, of humankind, and God in his uh, grace gave the possibility from that time on of anybody to come into fellowship with himself uh, by grace, so with the fall, it's as if it were, it works both ways. So the whole of humankind kind of falls with Adam and Eve in their disobedience to God. And of course, in a sense, this model is taking the New Testament and reading from the New Testament back into this kind of full narrative. As in Adam, all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. So I have to say that for myself, I believe, I suppose, Model A on Mondays, uh, Model B on Tuesdays, and probably Model C the rest of the week. But in other words, I'm presenting these models as ways of relating two bodies of knowledge. Um, I would be the last person who would want to um, take a model as if it was the actual theology itself. I think these are just ways of beginning to try and see how these two uh, kinds of understandings can talk to each other. And I think it's important, though, to notice that what all three of these models assume is that the fall brings in spiritual death. It does not bring in physical death into the world. And of course, that for, for many Christians I know um, out in churches and the general community is, is, a, is a problem. And, uh, you know, when I, I go out and give talks in churches, often that's a point for discussion. But I want to just say a few words, next five minutes, um, just to look at the whole if you like, dark face of providence, the question of theodicy, and just revisit just for a few seconds um, this uh, deep problem, really, of natural evil and the way that evolutionary biology uh, relates to that. You'll all be familiar with Leibniz and uh, the way, really, he put the whole theodicy question on the map as a sort of philosophical and theological question back in the 18th century. I always try and echo people like my old colleague um, from Oxford days, whom John Byrne also knows, um, Paul Fidus, who actually lost his own son under very tragic circumstances. This was written, in fact, before that terrible event happened, when he writes that no argument finally convinces we cannot rationalize God or fully explain suffering and evil. And there's a similar quote there from, from John Hick from his sort of classic book on the subject. I don't think, of course, that means we should remain silent about the matter. We still, everyone struggles with this whole issue of natural evils um, and how um, we relate to those as we're thinking about evolutionary biology. So a few very brief thoughts just to get discussion going, really. I suppose what we can do, uh, what we all do in thinking about theodicy is, or people's approach to it is reflected by their understanding of the omnipotence of God and really how far that omnipotence extends. And so you have a great sort of spectrum of views leading on this left-hand side, as it were, to what I call the laissez-faire God in, at one extreme, the, the, the God of process um, theology, who essentially lets the world, um, I guess, sort of basically do its own thing. And in this view, God, of course, deliberately restricts himself. He restricts his omnipotence. In, our, in order to allow the created order to be itself and to express its own uh, freedom and so forth. And you get this view also um, by those promoting the idea of kenosis, only meaning referring to not Philippians 2 so much as the idea of God restricting himself in this way that I just mentioned. And I guess a, a good representative of that position is Jack Howard, the Catholic theologian, um, who um, has this idea of God letting the creation be itself out of love willing, and I quote, willing to risk the disorder 
and deviation that actually occur in the evolution of cosmic beauty. And so the perceived advantage for constructing a coherent theodicy, of course, is that now God is no longer directly responsible for the ills of the created order, but instead its order and deviation, to use um, Hart's phrase, is a consequence of giving creation its freedom to develop. Now, as we move over to the right, as it were, we, we get the more um, uh, less laissez-faire, the more controlling, if you like, the more uh, God-in-control type of uh, theologies on the right-hand side, where, of course, God is viewed very much in, as faithful in creating and sustaining the properties of matter that will have those properties because God's faithfulness means upholding them, and this is part of what we mean when we talk about God's creation. And so God is in no sense denying his own nature in the creative process in this view, um, but rather, as Colin Gunton uh, states, there is no suggestion in the Bible that the act of creation is anything but the joyful giving of reality to the other. And so it's a much more uh, a view which emphasizes God's sovereignty over the whole of the created order, um, and I guess the, the more uh, Calvinist of those amongst us um, would be up, up, up the right there somewhere. So we're reminded of this wonderful quote from Austin Farrer, who, um, a theologian from Oxford of a previous era, when he said, poor limping world, why does not your kind creator pull the thorn out of your paw? But what sort of a thorn is this? And if it were pulled out, how much of the poor would remain? How much indeed of the creation? What would a physical universe be like from which all mutual interference of systems was removed? It would be no physical universe at all. It's quite interesting to meditate on, on that, uh, I think, very um, perceptive comment. And that brings us then more to the right, if you like, in the spectrum. Left and right have, have no political connotations, by the way. They're just purely on the screen. Okay. But on the right here, of course, we have a God who does have set intentions and purposes to the world that are being and will be fulfilled through the created order. So John Hicks' veil of soul-making comes into this account where God creates, um, if you like, a tough world. It's a world where moral and spiritual growth is possible. It's a world in which there is pain and death and plenty of challenges uh, to our comfort and well-being. In a world, it's, in a word, it's more like, I, I would say, a boot camp than a vacation camp. Okay? So well, Christians, I think, have this idea, you know, the world is a vacation camp. Well, in this view, then, the world looks much more like a, a boot camp somewhere where really dependency upon God's grace is the only safe option. But, of course, there's a strong eschatological element to this view where God is preparing the new heavens and the new earth where there will be no more pain or suffering and ultimately the whole created order will be redeemed and all its best aspects brought in uh, to the fulfill, fulfilled kingdom of God. And new here, as my uh, theologian friends always like to point out, of course, is the Greek kaini, new in quality, not neos, which means not having existed before. And I think it's this tension of the present evil age with the age which is to come, the fulfilled kingdom of God, that brings out most clearly, to my mind, at least, the evil of natural evil. Not evil in the sense that it's a consequence of moral evil, but rather in its contrast with the fulfilled kingdom of God in which Jesus will finally be Lord. So Jesus confronts illnesses in the New Testament uh, accounts not because they're the immediate consequence of any personal evil, as he makes clear, not because of sin, but because of eschatological incompleteness. They're not part of the future kingdom. And you just get so many verses, don't you, about his healing being linked to the, the coming kingdom and so forth. So I guess the really big theological puzzle for us right now is why the cost in terms of suffering and disease and death really needs, seems to be uh, needful to be this high in order to bring about God's new redeemed family by freely willed response into this new heavens and the new earth. Maybe this is the only way in which there can be creatures who can respond freely to God's love and the costs are part of that whole uh, perspective. So I think we're a bit like scientists at the moment with quantum theory from a utilitarian perspective. Quantum theory works perfectly well. Schrodinger's equation always works. 
Um, but if you